Hello and welcome back and that's right today I want to do a should you buy for Synology NAS. I've already done this before about two and a half years ago. In fact I made this video but so much has changed in two and a half years about Synology and some things have remained the same that I wanted to revisit this and do an updated 2023 and 2024 should you buy or before you buy about Synology. I'm going to give you five reasons why you should consider Synology as your network attached storage an effective to backup solution of choice and i'm going to give you five reasons why you might want to steer clear of them because there is good there is bad no one is perfect so let's crack on with number one now unsurprisingly number one it's going to be DSM. If you are already a Synology NAS owner, but you wanted to keep up to date with things that are going on, or you already know about the brand, or you are someone that is considering it and already read up about it, you'll know that one of the biggest selling points of Synology's platform is Disk Station Manager. Currently in version 7.2, uh, release candidate at the time of recording, we've flicked to the screen now. Um, DSM 7.2 is pretty much everything you're going to need. It does, you know, it is intuitive, it is user friendly, it has a barrage of different first party applications for backing up, for synchronization, for multimedia, for business, for virtual machines, you name it, it has got it. And the real key thing about Synology's platform and its software is that they have effectively a first party application for most things. And although they support a lot of third party apps, the support of third party is nowhere near as extensive as those first party apps. We have everything from Video Station, which works as an alternative to Plex Media Server. We have got active backup for uh, business, active backup uh, for uh, supporting Google Workspace. Uh, we have got active backup supporting Office 365 connectivity there, allowing you to synchronize those third party SAAS services with the first party ones from Synology and run localized whole system image based backups comparable to the likes of Apple Time Machine but for a multitude of different platforms onto the NAS whole system image backups which you can restore on a bare metal uh, client machine on top of that you've got support of virtual machines you've got support of containers there as well you've got local file folder level backups as well you have a whole range of applications available from Synology and that doesn't even touch on things like Synology Drive which allows you to synchronize files and folders natively on Windows and Mac systems with file streaming and file pinning and metadata and general data caching locally on the systems and on the NAS working together creating an incredible setup between all the different devices within the Synology network storage ecosystem there. Then you've got that whole collaboration suite of um, Synology chat for communication there between devices. Synology Office allowing you to use uh, its whole Office application for word processing, for sheets, for um, PDF, for everything all within this ecosystem here, Synology Mail, Synology Surveillance Station, um, to run your own surveillance up with cameras dotted around your home or business environment. And all of this being done in an incredibly fluid and easy to use software platform with multiple mobile applications, multiple desktop applications, multiple server grade applications to install on different third party Linux servers, and the whole thing being accessible there via web browser incredibly easily. And with it feeling fluid when you're accessing a system over the local area network or remotely over the internet, feeling local, as you can see here in front of you. And it's just DSM, for a lot of users, is worth the price of admission and arguably is the thing that Synology sell their whole platform on. That is right. This is one thing that has definitely changed since my previous before you buy two and a half years ago. But now we're seeing progressive integration of M2 NVMEs to be used as storage pools within their system. Now, for the beginner or those that aren't aware, most Synology systems have got those standard hard drive bays there or uh, SSD bays, but also the majority of releases outside of the value series for the last three to even four years have arrived with bays at the base that allow you to install super fast M2 NVMEs. However, it's only been in the last six to 12 months, and 12 months is pushing it, that Synology have been allowing these to be used 
for storage, not just caching. That means you can have an area of storage in your Synology system that is considerably faster than slower optical hard drives that you may be utilizing inside. And if you're looking to edit on the NAS system or just have databases working from within the Synology, having them living or individual applications living and working from volumes uh, housed on much faster SSDs is enormously beneficial. Now, it's worth highlighting, it's not accessible to all Synology NASes, but although it was something that was rolled out right at the end of 2022, we've seen not only further systems released after that, allowing the support of this feature, but also they've slowly but surely been retroactively enabling this feature on old devices. Not all, and it's been a very slow process with DSM 7.2, enabling individual devices at this time, but still nonetheless, the fact that Synology now allow M2 NVMEs to be used as storage pools is a huge change in two and a half years. And a great update, I believe, in terms of storage, media and throughput accessibility on their platform. That is right, Synology was one of the very, very few turnkey NAS solutions, that's hardware, software combined, ready to roll solution out the gate, that was not successfully targeted by the Deadbolt ransomware group. If we flick over to the screen, you can see here that during 2022, the ransomware known as Deadbolt or the Deadbolt group were actively attacking NAS devices that had port open to the internet and successfully encrypting those devices in some cases in exchange for a ransomware key. And although QNAP really did hit the big stories about it when it was getting hit um, actively repeatedly, they were not the only ones. Asus Thought and Terramaster and indeed non NAS platforms were hit. However, throughout that, although clearly Synology had been within the scope of this deadbolt group, they were not successfully targeted. Now, bang back to camera there. Now, that isn't to say that Synology is not actively targeted by ransomware groups. Of course, all NAS brands will end up, the bigger they get, having a mark on their back where these um, you know, uh, intruder groups are observing them and trying to find loopholes. And indeed, Synology, like all the other brands, has their own security advisory page where it lists vulnerabilities traditionally normally found in Linux. Um, which then get built upon uh, or repaired upon by other uh, software brands as they use Linux kernels within the development of their own software. But it has to be highlighted massively that during a period where uh, the Deadbolt ransomware was attacking all manner of different uh, NAS devices, Synology, with a huge number of devices out there in the wild, there wasn't, to my mind, a single successful penetration and encryption of a Synology device by that deadbolt group in that period and kudos to them for that. Now this is going to depend on what kind of user you are but it has to be said that very few brands have done such a good job to create a complete hardware ecosystem around a network attached storage device like Synology have. What I mean by that is although you might go and buy a Synology NAS system, Synology not only provide the NAS, they also provide the hard drives if you choose to with both enterprise level hard drives the HAT5300, the upcoming or hopefully released by the time you're watching this HAT3300 um, standard class, they've got SAS drives, they've got um, M2 NVMe SSDs, they've got SATA SSDs as well at 2.5 inch. Then after that, they've got network upgrades in 10 GBE, they've got combo card upgrades, again, all official first party alongside dedicated M2 NVMe upgrade cards and even micro 10G upgrades for their desktop systems like the E10G22. Then on top of that, they've got their own memory upgrades there, ECC and non-ECC as well. It even goes as far as having security cameras in their surveillance series with these cameras dedicated towards surveillance station with um, AI recognition built into those cameras for human vehicle and such. They've even got dedicated NVR systems that got a deep video analysis to take AI recognition and um, analysis even further. They've even got their own range 
of routers that you can use to have a single brand one eco network storage system at your fingertips and if you are someone that wants to keep it all in-house whether for warranty or support Synology is going to be tremendously appealing particularly if you look at the unified ubiquity rounds where you are going for that single modular ecosystem that's all compliant and compatible this is going to be an enormously attractive premise to you whether you are a home a medium-sized business or large business alike. If you're concerned about power consumption and noise, it should also be added that of all the brands that I talk about here on the channel, Synology are the ones that have got the best handle on it across the majority of their range. Now, if you're looking at bigger rack mount solutions, of course, then of course they're going to be a noisier because of the fans, their metal build quality there, and just genuinely the power consumption of the processors and hardware that go into them is always going to be higher. However, if you go further, you know, towards the middle and the bottom tiers of their solutions, and I include the Plus Series in that, and Anything in desktop form up to about six or eight bays, you will always find that they are lower noise and that power consumption is lower. But on top of that, if we move over to the screen now, we can see that not only when I did a series of different videos where we tested the noise levels of these systems, bringing the mic a bit closer, um, when we tested the noise level across a multitude of different Synology NAS systems using hard drives, SSDs and enterprise level drives, the systems were quieter. When we went into power consumption and started going through all of these individual systems in terms of the actual cost per watt uh, the, this would cost you on a Synology NAS, we kept finding that the Synology NAS systems, thanks to having a better dynamicism towards adjusting itself internally for hibernation or standby mode just seemed to be better and whether it was uh, based on the hour the day the week the month or the year depending on where you are in the world it definitely cost less to run a Synology NAS overall and indeed that is thanks to if you go into DSMs as you can see here not only some general power schedules there with regard to the system and its lighting which is going to be very very small but rather way down to creating power schedules where you can have the system sh um, shut down and boot up at certain times of day when it's not going to be used and that could extend all the way towards the automated hard drive hibernation where the system would um, spin down the drives after a certain period of inactivity which was adjustable so what i'm saying is that the synology nas platform generally like for like comparisons against the hardware available on other brands for the same level of hardware gives you a lower noise impact and a lower power consumption both dynamically and customizable but moving back to the camera it's not perfect nothing is and so let's go through the five things that make synology nas maybe not the right platform for you That's right, compatibility on the Synology platform has become something of a hot, sticky topic over the last couple of years, and it's to do with the way Synology have sort of partitioned different services and hardware in their portfolio and changed um, the compatibility and support of them. The biggest example is to do with their own storage media on the enterprise level tiers, and if we flick over to the screen now, we can see here, for example, this is the compatibility list for the Synology DS923, a four bay, and as you can see there, if you go for the brands, there's several brands supported there. The drives go up to 18 TB, even though some of those brands have got larger drives at 20 and 22 TB at the time of recording, going up to 26 soon, but they're still not on there. But nonetheless, there are other brands. However, if we look at an enterprise level device like the DS36, uh, 22XS Plus, and we look at the hard drive compatibility there, immediately most of those brands disappeared, and indeed only one WD drive is there, because it's quite a unique drive. But still nonetheless, in that case, they've removed that official support, or at least official compatibility and confirmed compatibility from there. And if you use a Synology NAS system with the drives that aren't on that compatibility list, it will throw a little bit of a warning at you there. The same goes, flicking back to camera, if you want to use their M2 NVMEs. Now, we mentioned earlier on that you can use M2 NVMEs now as storage balls on some Synology NAS systems which is good right well you can only do it even on 
the SMB and lower systems in the Plus series using their own drives. If you use third-party drives, you can use those for caching, but you can't use them for storage balls. And I think this whole position on compatibility, at least as far as the middle ground, those small, medium businesses and lower, has ruffled some feathers when those users want to go for the bigger, badder systems in, say, the XS series and above. And that compatibility has become something of a sticking point for users that have looked at, as mentioned, those more powerful systems systems for editing maybe they're a one two solo creator and they had their eyes on using wd red <clears throat> seagate iron wolf or even drives they already had in their possession if they use them in that system they're using them outside of the support uh, levels and compatib confirm compatibility by synology and there is a small possibility that they will not support your claims for support if you need them down the line This next one pretty much hasn't changed since that previous video two and a half years ago. But when you're buying a Synology NAS system, do be aware that whatever price tag you are paying, the bulk of that price is for the software more than it is the hardware. I used to say it was 60-40, but realistically, it's 70-30 or maybe even a higher ratio than that. DSM is an exceptional platform that is well-developed and well-invested within and a great user-friendly, fully-featured product. But that does mean that because the price tag you're buying is so heavily leveraged in favor of the software, the price you're paying for the hardware can sometimes be quite un, you know quite underwhelming in some cases and irritating in others you will get a system where the hardware value point if you don't factor in the software cost will be really depressing you'll be looking at systems running cpus that you think this nas should be something like 20 to 30 percent the price tag and i'm not going to use dsm great but then bear in mind that you are buying a system that has been designed for the utility of that software it just means that you're going to have to pay more for powerful hardware on the Synology platform because of that default ratio towards DSM on the price tag. And talking about the software and what's included with the package, one of the most intriguing and arguably attractive features for a lot of users that came away from companies like Drobo onto the Synology platform, um, SHR, Synology Hybrid RAID, isn't actually available on all Synology systems. Now, what I mean by that is um, Synology Hybrid RAID allows you to mix and match the drives that you use in your storage pool, your RAID configuration. Now, what I mean by that is a normal traditional RAID, your RAID 1, your RAID 5, your RAID 6, your RAID 10, your RAID whatever, needs all of those drives to be the same capacity. And if one of the drives is a smaller capacity, it will view every single drive the same as the smallest capacity. You could have nine 10 tb drives and a one tb drive traditional raid will see them all as one tb you're not going to mix and match your drives on day one but a few years down the line when you add more drives you might want the option to include bigger drives and that's why people like shr and the same reason they liked beyond raid um, on the drobo platform because in in synology hybrid raid you can use bigger drives the raid is configured on whatever the biggest drive is and it creates that much of a safety net a redundancy if you will so you can use that same configuration of 9 10 tbs and a 1 tb drive and all it will do is create a 10 tb redundancy safety net and give you all of that other storage straight away giving you 81 terabytes overall Unfortunately, SHR is not available on XS level series devices, it is not available on the SA series, any enterprise level system doesn't give you that, which is really annoying when those are the systems with the most number of bays to populate, and it would be nice to be able to use bigger drives down the line and partially populate on day one. Now, there are ways around it. If you own an SHR and an older gen Synology NAS system, you can actually move those drives over and migrate the SHR over that's fine, you're still within the support, but you can't actively select a brand new installation in Synology Hybrid RAID on a new XS level series. So for all of the advantages you hear about the Synology platform, if one of the things that was the tipping point to take you into going for Synology SHR, just know that SHR is not available on all systems.
this next one leads into that whole point I made about single ecosystem when I mentioned all the extra bits and bobs that are rolled in within the Synology hardware um, um, uh, accessory kits that allow you to create a single ecosystem. But some of you may have noticed I didn't mention Synology C2, Synology's cloud platform. So you can have your NAS and you can have a cloud platform, an area of cloud space for you to have an off-site backup, but also use it as an access point for uh, remote users without them going directly into the NAS. That cloud platform is extending into multi a multitude of uh, uh, backup and disaster recovery options, as well as synchronization with other tools too. And they've integrated other apps and services and analytical tools into the Synology C2 platform. Alongside that, the Synology C2, which is a cloud synchronized surveillance platform running in conjunction with a camera via the Synology NAS, allowing you um, dual recording patterns and a lower loss uh, potential if the camera is smashed between the feed going into the camera into the NAS and backed up there. So why is this in the negative side? Why have I not talked about it that much in the positive? Well, because although there's a trial available, buying a Synology NAS does not give you any guaranteed space on that cloud. You still have to pay for it as an extra. And there's a lot of users, myself included, that think Synology should at the very least include some free space from C2 on these platforms. One, because I think people would upgrade that storage. Two, because even Synology themselves maintain that a NAS is not strictly a backup if you're not using it right. If you're sending your data onto this NAS from eight or nine devices over here, and then you delete it from those devices, that's not a backup anymore. That is the single version of that file. It's as safe there as it was over there. If anything, it's less safe because all of these devices' data are now in one losable place. And if they get deleted from there, that makes it irreplaceable. They've done lots of things with immutable backups, lots of stuff with support of write once, read many, uh, encrypted uh, volumes, all of that stuff. But they also provide the means to back up to the cloud and other NAS devices, but they don't include any space for Synology C2 with your Synology purchase, which still seems weird to me when most semi-cloud devices these days, or at least cloud-supported devices that have a first-party cloud, give you at least a tokenistic amount of space to play with. You can utilize some of the backup features of your Synology account online, but when it comes to access to Synology C2, you don't get anything included with your NAS. And lastly, the connectivity of Synology NAS is still weird. I mentioned this in the previous video about Synology prioritizing network and remote access over local. But if anything, two and a half years later, it's not only not improved on that point, but if anything, it's got more garbled. So, for example, if you're looking at any of the new Synology NAS systems in 2023, they all still arrive with USB 3.2 Gen 1, 5 gigabit connectivity there. They've even reduced the range of devices that you can connect over USB to their devices. So things like printers and scanners are gone, and although you can attach storage, network adapters are no longer supported, and that means that you can't use newer upgraded network connectivity. And carrying on with that, most Synology NAS systems arrive with 1 GBE or 10 GBE or you have to get upgrades there. Options such as 5 GBE and 2.5 GBE, which at this point are available on domestic routers, are available on ISP routers, are available on their routers, still aren't on their own platform. And not being able to add a $20 2.5 G, two and a half times network speed upgrade over USB to their devices, particularly now they support SMB multi-channel, as and they've always done link aggregation and port trunking, seems bizarre to me. And indeed, if you look at, say, the DS923+, Plus, which supports a 10 GB upgrade, it utilizes a proprietary strange one that, although is incredibly user-friendly, means you have to go for their preset 10G upgrade rather than a normal PCIe upgrade, which is more expensive overall. And this kind of continues. If you go towards their larger PCIe upgrade cards, <clears throat> there is a 25 gig fiber channel card, but it's only a dual port. Now, most fiber channel uh, 25G cards are dual port because of the architecture of it. But still, nonetheless, to go from 
1 GPE to 10 GPE in strange ways and fixed ways in most cases and then go straight up to a dual port 50 gig card and very little in between is messy and ultimately it means that Synology's platform still continues to be a weirdly inconsistent platform when it comes to connectivity and the devices you use to connect with it and the software support within DSM. But this has been, should you buy the Synology NAS, the 2023 and 2024 version? Did I miss something for you? Let me know in the comments. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I will be doing a video like this for a number of other brands very, very soon, so stay tuned for that. But apart from that, use the guides linked in the description. Use the free advice section over on NAS Compares and Ask NAS Compares. Use the Discord or use any one of our multifaceted ways to get some free support over out of us. And if this video has helped you, and if you were going to shop at b and Newegg, Amazon, that sort of thing, please, please, please use the link in the description to take you there. But only if you were going to buy there anyway, and only if you found this video helpful. It results in using those links. Anything you buy after you click those links results in a kickback to me and Eddie. And as compares, it's just us and allows us to keep doing what we do. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.